Good morning, everybody. We're going to now have our message. So this week, this past week, we uh, had Bible study Thursday night, and we studied Acts chapter 3. What a great, great chapter in the Bible. Acts chapter 3, Peter, Peter and John, out there sharing the gospel. There was a guy that was paralyzed from birth, from his mother's womb, it says. And he was laid outside the temple, the synagogue, and... You know, he was begging for alms, begging for money. And uh, Peter walks up to him and says, you know, gold and silver I can't give you. But you know what? Look at me. The guy that places his eyes upon him and ultimately just a picture of Jesus Christ. You know, we don't get, it's not about getting anything physically from Christ, but it's all about receiving the spiritual rebirth. That man gazed his eyes upon him and by faith, he was ultimately physically healed, a picture of us, how we're spiritually healed. Just an amazing book to read a chapter. And then Peter and John, through the Holy Spirit, Peter revealed to all the people there in Acts chapter 3, 13, which is, I thought it was just amazing because it talked about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how they glorified God's son, Jesus Christ. And I've reflected on that a lot this week, how Abraham glorified Jesus Christ how Abraham was justified by his faith and then went into and all the nations shall be blessed by his seed we know the seed is Jesus Christ it tells us that in Galatians 3 16 so rightly dividing the truth rightly dividing the Word of God tells us that Abraham he believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior John 8 56 tells us that Abraham seen the day of Christ so just an awesome study. Then it went on to Moses and all the prophets before Moses spoke of Christ. All the prophets after Moses spoke of Christ. All the prophets before Samuel spoke of Christ. And all the prophets after Samuel speak of Christ. Again, and again, the Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 and 19 was what was quoted there with Moses in Deuteronomy. And it said, you know, a prophet shall be come after him like him. And we're obviously speaking of Christ. And Moses said, if you don't hear his word, basically, you're going to be condemned. Just again, how the whole Bible speaks of Christ. Beautiful stuff. Love reading the word. Last week, we ended with 1 Corinthians 16. Anathema maratha. Basically, cursed, the Lord cometh. If you don't believe in the Christ Jesus as your Savior, you know, curse the that's a curse upon you. Christ is still coming. He's going to rapture us. We will not go through the tribulation. And ultimately, Christ will put his feet here on earth after the 70th week of Daniel. And we end 1 Corinthians. And we move to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to look at Timothy as Paul writes a letter to Timothy. We talked a lot about Timothy last <laughs> week. And we know Timothy was a pastor at Ephesus. So let's read 1 Timothy. I think everybody's going to enjoy Timothy, six chapters, first book to Timothy. This is Paul and Savanius and Timothy. Under the church of Thessalonians, wrong book. Probably everybody's like, what? So 1 Timothy chapter 1, I was reading 2 Thessalonians there. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in faith, grace, mercy, peace from God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can turn over to Galatians right now because we're going to talk about Paul, how he was an apostle appointed <coughs> by Christ himself. Talked about that in Acts chapter 1 there, but we'll look at in Galatians here, chapter 1, verse 15 through 18, and then we'll look at Galatians chapter 2. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, 
Neither when I went up to Jerusalem to them which are apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. We know Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9, as we're not singing right now, we're looking at the Bible close. But anyways, we know that as Paul was going to Damascus, on the road to Damascus, that is when ultimately he seen Jesus Christ. He trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. We know right here, according to the Bible, that Paul went to the desert for three years and studied with Christ. We know that he was handpicked by Christ. And if you turn the page here, Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, and we have a Gentile church today that says Peter was the first pope, that Peter was a pastor under the Gentiles. And that's not accurate because the Bible tells us that Peter was an apostle to the circumcision and Paul was an apostle to the uncircumcision, the Gentile nation. And it's Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was under Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So Paul, handpicked by God, to be an apostle to the Gentiles, us. Peter, ultimately appointed, he was a fisher from Galilee, appointed to be apostle to the Jews. And we know that there are many people today, I often see it on Facebook, that people proclaiming, trusting in their lineage, their culture. And ultimately we have people today that want to be a Jew so bad but ultimately, what does the Bible say about the Jew? And I can understand why people want to be the Jew, because the Jew is what, that's God's chosen people. And ultimately today, when we preach the gospel, it doesn't matter if we preach it to the uncircumcision or circumcision, we preach to the Gentile Jew, and ultimately we preach to everybody so they can receive Christ, because in the body of Christ, we're seen as Jew. The chosen are in Christ. If you want to truly be a Jew, you must be in Christ. That's what it talks about. The answer is in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. It says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. That's what we preach. We don't, we don't care about if you're Jew or Gentile, if you're circumcised or not circumcised today. We preach the gospel. And if you truly want to be part of the chosen, if you want to be a Jew, you must be in Christ. It's of a circumcised not heart, not a physical circumcision. It's trusting not in your works, but the finished redemptive work of Christ. We know that in Jeremiah, it actually prophesied, I think it's Jeremiah 31, that prophesied of a circumcised heart. And ultimately, that is trusting in the finished redemptive work of Christ. Not trusting in yourself for salvation. So the Jew is a conversion not on the outside. The Jew is not a circumcision on the outside. The Jew is one who has been converted on the inside. The Jew is the one who has been circumcised heart. The Jew is the one who believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are the chosen. And it says in Ephesians 1, 4, According as he has chosen us in whom before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So the chosen are in Christ. God never predestined or chose individuals to eternal condemnation or heaven. But he said the chosen are in Christ. And it is your position. It is your choice. What do you choose? Do you choose to be part of the chosen? Do you choose to be in Christ? Or do you say, you know what? I don't want to be in Christ. I'll do it my way. As Frank Sinatra says often. The chosen are in Christ. And it is your decision if you want to be in Christ or not. You have a choice. We are at the jail last Monday night and I told the men and I had heard, I think it was Kevin said this one time, I tell the men all the time, we, don't, we never chose to come into this world, but you will choose where you spend eternity. It is your choice. Do you choose to spend it in heaven? Do you choose to spend it eternally in eternal condemnation? It is a choice. 
believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, burial, resurrection, and you are, in, you are in Christ, which you decided to be part of the chosen. You decided to be a Jew inwardly. You decided to believe in the finished redemptive work of Christ. Believe not. And you choose not to be the chosen. You choose not to be a Jew inwardly. You choose not to believe in the finished redemptive work of Christ. And you choose to be condemned eternally. Every choice a person makes in this life has consequences. Consequences can be positive or negative. The choice to be chosen or not will determine where you spend eternity. It is the most important decision that we will make as his creation. So again, in the first century church, Peter appointed to share the gospel with circumcision. First century church, Paul appointed to share the gospel. Today, we share with everybody. Let's go back to Timothy. We also love the words there, grace, mercy, and peace. I think it was chapter 2 there. If you study the Bible, you'll never see mercy, you'll never see peace come before grace. Grace, unmerited favor, we don't deserve it. We often talk about that. I think it's worthy to mention. And mercies, we know we, we don't get something that we deserve. We actually deserve to go to hell, and he's granted us mercy. So grace, we get something we don't deserve. Mercy, we, get, we, we should get something that we do deserve. That is hell, but we don't get that. So we see how grace and mercy come together at the cross, and ultimately through that, we have peace. Peace in the finished redemptive work of Christ. We're going to get into verse 3 and 4. As I besought... Thee to abide still at Ephesus while I went into Macedonia, that you might as charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and the shining genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. There is no other doctrine. There is no other doctrine. There is the only one gospel. Let us not entertain fables. For example, Mother Earth. See today that everybody's on this movement of Mother Earth. It's, it is God's creation. This is His Earth. And it will end when He has the appointed time to end it. We will have a new Earth. But it will not end until God says it end. There are no aliens today. You can't turn on the television without trying to be like this alien, this alien, that. Let's not entertain Greek gods, Roman gods, or even now a the god of Odin, this Viking trilogy, this Viking uh, the mythology that continues to rise up today that we hear often about. I see Thor's hammer tattooed more often today than I've ever seen. Thor's necklaces, it is a pagan religion. Let's not entertain any of it. You know what? So let's not entertain. Everyone goes to heaven. Let's not entertain evolution because, you know, which, to me, which really says, evolution says, there is no purpose of life. And to me, I believe evolution is the number one con contributor to teen suicide, myself. When you have a, tell a child over and over, There's, there is no purpose, you have no purpose, and you're created from this, I could understand why a child then, by the time 13, 14, 15, would say, you know what, I might as well take my life. False teachers do not answer questions, and that's what it says here. It says, you know what, basically, uh, which minister questions. That's what false religion does. They don't answer questions. They just actually provoke more questions. False teachers actually more questions and keep people confused. We know that we serve the God of order. 1 Corinthians 4, 1433. Not the God of confusion. 1440. The doctrine of salvation is very simple. Believe. Carla posted a verse this week, which I love, and it was Hebrews chapter 12. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, our faith starts with Jesus, and our faith ends with Jesus. 
Jesus Christ is the author of our faith. Jesus Christ is the finisher of our faith. Again, our faith does not start in us or our own works. It starts with Jesus Christ and his finished redemptive work. Jesus Christ's death payment for sin, burial, and resurrection. It does not end with us making a promise. It doesn't end with us you know, feeling bad for our sin, for turning from it. It doesn't end with us partnering with God. No, it ends with Jesus Christ when he says it is finished. He is the author and finisher of our faith. It's all about him. Our faith is placed in him, what he's done for us. Our, our faith begins in Jesus and ends in Jesus. That's what ultimately we should be thinking about. And ultimately we know that is a sound doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy verse 5, verse 7. Now the end of the commandment is charity. Out of a pure heart, good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved, have turned aside on a vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whether they affirm. Matthew chapter 15 talks about ditch drivers. The blind leaving the blind. You know what? The lost leading the lost. That's what ditch drivers do. They, don't, they never ever hit the highway. They jump from one ditch to the next, leading the blind to the lost. The highway to hell. But here the Bible tells us preachers need to be motivated in love. If you preach the gospel, you are a preacher motivated in love because you're concerned about people's salvation. Remember, Jesus fulfilled the law by one word, which was love. He loved all of us sinners and became sin for all of us. He bore our sin in his own body, 1 Peter 2.24. The gospel of Jesus Christ is founded on the principle of love, yet the Bible tells us beware of certain individuals because they lost, they lost their course. It tells us here that they swerved, and I wrote their compass has a defect. Now they think, they think they had, now what they think is true north have swerved off the course and they now sound a bell, like a bell with no chime. That's what it tells us, a bell with no chime, a vain jangling. It's nothing there. There's no substance. There's no substance to what they preach. They have a desire to be teachers of the law, and I've seen this personally. People get saved and later on, and they go back, and they go back on the law. They have a desire to be teachers of the law, yet the Bible says they know not what they affirm or say. They have no idea what they're saying. See, remember, everything in the Bible speaks of Christ. When a preacher loses sight of Jesus Christ and their teachings, they are off course. They are off course. Because I want to show you some scripture here in Timothy. It's amazing because it's all about Jesus. They tell us that sound doctrine is his words. That's what sound doctrine is. And we're going to get that into a little bit. 1 Timothy 8 through 11. But we say that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed into my trust. So the law is not made for the saved. The law is not made for us. The law is not made for the righteous, because the righteous ones are in Christ. Turn back a couple of pages to Philippians chapter 3. Paul gives us a definition here of where he receives his righteousness. We studied this verse at Bible study this past Thursday. If you read this, look what he says. And it goes, it's just so important. If there was any man that could have been saved by works, it probably would have been Paul, but he was never saved by that. And it's, it's interesting that he finally recognized that. And ultimately, the road to Damascus, that was pointed out to him. But here we read in Philippians 3, 
Verse 1, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, not in self, to write the same things to you, to indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. That's what false preachers are. Beware of evil workers. That's what, file, that's what false preachers are. Beware of the concision. And you know what the concision is? That ultimately, they take out words. They remove words to promote their own doctrine. That's what concision is. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. So here we are, we see, just like Romans 2, 28 29, he is a circumcised heart. Verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. If there's any man that thinks he is good enough, I'm telling you, I have more. He's telling us that. And now, then he goes on to list his credentials. Circumcised the eighth day. He was born under the law. His mom and dad were both purebreds. And he ultimately, eighth day, was already starting to fulfill the law there in man's eyes. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. Touching the law, he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee, a legalist. Concerning zeal, he was a zealot. He persecuted the Christian church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now he was blameless in man's eyes, but he was not blameless in God's eyes. He was a sinner. But man could not look, man could look at him and say they could find no fault in him. But later on, he knew that God seen him as a sinner. Seven. But what things were gained to me, those that counted loss for Christ. So all the stuff that he listed means meaningless, meaningless because he now knows Christ. Yet doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And here's where righteousness is defined and be found in Christ, in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We know that the law is for the lost. We know that Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous, no, not one. We know Romans 3, 19 and 20 says, Now we know what things of whatsoever the law say, that say to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. All the world may be guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his, light, his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law was given to show us that we uh, fall short. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we believers here, in 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 11, we don't go back under the law when we're saved. That's not what it's about. We grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us that. But grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Now that you've received the Spirit, now you're a child of God, you're born of the Father, adopted into his family, he gives us the spirit to understand that we can, when we read his word, we can see Christ on every page. So we, here we have the Bible telling us that sound doctrine is the glorious gospel. Look at verse 10 at the end. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, semicolon, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, sound doctrine is the gospel of the blessed God, Jesus Christ. The glorious gospel has been committed to our trust it tells us that we should, that is the most valuable, valuable thing that's been given to us, and we should value that with our lives. It's been committed to our trust. The glorious gospel has been committed to our trust. Let us not mess it up. Turn over to chapter 6, 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, 5. I read this this morning, and I was like, this is very good stuff here. If any man teach otherwise, consent not 
to the wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions, and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. <coughs> Doctrine according to godliness is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, not the words of mankind. <coughs> Unsound or ungodly doctrine is rooted in pridefulness. Tells us right there, verse 4, pride. That's why they ultimately, they're preaching the things that they do. They know not what they preach when they preach the laws, what they tell us. Unsound ungodly doctrine knows nothing. It tells us they know nothing. A lot of vain jangling. There's no substance to the words. They say a lot. It might sound good, but there's no substance to it. They say, the Bible tells us, it is, they know nothing. Matter of fact, unsound or ungodly doctrine makes more questions. Unsound or ungodly doctrine makes men want to argue. Unsound or ungodly doctrine corrupts minds, is what it does. That's what it tells us. Unsound or ungodly doctrine opposes the truth. Unsound or ungodly doctrine teach gain is godliness. And don't we have the prosperity gospel today? Plant a seed of a $1,000 and you get $10,000. We see these mega churches today filled. Pastors, everybody's making some serious money. We, the Catholic church is the largest landowner in the world. And yet here, unsound or ungodly doctrine teach gain is godliness. Do we not see religions around the world getting rich off the elderly? They get rich off the widows, and they get rich off the poor. It is clear the Bible teaches that if you are hearing unsound or ungodly doctrine, you need to remove self immediately. So as it says, yes, at the end of five, from such withdraw thyself. Amazing stuff. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And I love how Paul writes here, goes into, you know, some unsound doctrine. And then he comes back to 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious, but I attained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul a murderer, now a minister. Paul was a persecutor, now a preacher. All by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amazing stuff. Paul does not thank the law. He doesn't thank his priest. He doesn't thank his lineage. He doesn't thank his rabbi. He thanks Jesus Christ. Paul praises Jesus Christ for his justification, sanctification, glorification, because all blessings come from Jesus Christ. There's only one to thank. Only one to thank. Paul says he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and he was a bully. He was a bully. The root cause of ungodly behavior is ignorance. The root cause of ungodly behavior is ignorance. It tells us that. Today, no excuse. Men who pervert the gospel of Christ are ignorant. They're ignorant. That's what the Bible tells us. People who follow someone who listen to someone who perverts the gospel are ignorant. Individuals who depart from the way and go back to the law, ignorant. I think that's important to understand. Let's not be ignorant. Let's ultimately keep our minds on Christ. Let's not fall into the pride and ultimately remind, remind us who we are, just like Paul says, and all by the grace, I thank God who entrusted me, counted me faithful, put me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injured, Injurious. He was a bully. I believe I was probably the same. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.14 And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. Made me think of Romans 5 this morning. Romans 5 20 through 21 And let me read it. It says, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. We read that in Romans 3, 19, 20. 
all men guilty before God, so we can know where our offense is, we can see it, the law given, and be like, okay, I am a sinner. And then it goes on, it says, but where sin abounded, we can put a circle around it, maybe there's different levels of sin, but ultimately you can go as far out as you want, grace did much more abound. You can always circle grace, always goes around sin. You can draw sin way out here, grace always goes around it. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. You can't out sin grace. Jesus Christ has already paid for all sin, was buried, resurrected. That is an awesome thing to know. You can never lose your salvation. First Timothy 1.15 This is a thankful saying and worthy of all ex acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief Paul is the chief of sinners Paul persecuted and killed Christians because of their faith in Christ turn over to Acts chapter 8 verses 1 and 3 Acts we see Saul here who was Paul before his conversion and we can read exactly what's Saul does. And Saul was consenting unto his death. We know that Stephen in Acts chapter 7, Paul actually gave the thumbs up to kill or thumbs down to take his life. And Saul was consenting his death, so he killed Christians, a murderer to a minister. And at, the same, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And the <laughs> devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him, lamented, grieved. For Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them prison. He was the chief of sinners, killed the Christians because of their faith in Christ. And I think it's important to understand, we need to understand here, Paul. If Paul can get saved, his motivation was that he hated Christ. He killed people because of their faith in Christ. This man. And then he became a believer one day. And I think it's we need to see that if Paul can get saved, anybody can get saved. And I think that's important to understand here. He is the chief of sinners, and he got saved. Anybody can get saved. Look at verse 16. How be it for this cause, I obtain mercy. Not getting what he deserves. That in the that in me, my first. Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, which is patience, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul received mercy, not getting what he deserves. Jesus Christ was patient with Paul and he granted him grace. You have received mercy, not getting what you deserve. We know that Jesus Christ is patient with you and he's given you your entire life to believe. Paul believed in the finished redemptive work of Christ and he was born again, receiving eternal life the second he believed. That is the pattern for all humanity thereafter. Believe and receive eternal life. That is the pattern. Verse 17. Now under the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the honor and glory forever and ever, King eternal, what an awesome thing. Jesus Christ has forever been king and he will forever be king. Jesus Christ has forever been immortal and he will forever be immortal because he is God. There's only one God and, he's not, and he is wise, not unto the wisdom of men, but the wisdom of God. Let's look at verse 18 through 20. <coughs> This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, a command, a charge, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith, good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, 
of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And I wrote here, I'm like, defending the faith. And reading that again, I'd like to say it is a war. It is a battle. It is a spiritual warfare happening amongst us. Taking non-believers, heretics, and ultimately preaching other doctrines that are not doctrine, they're unsound, unbiblical, they're not the words of Christ. But we also have apostates, believers that have come, rised up amongst us, the ones that have trusted in the finished redemptive work, and now have swerved off the path. It is a constant battle of making sure that leaven does not creep into the body of Christ, that we keep the gospel pure, we preach the words of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So when I hear, I hear him basically telling Timothy, you know, it is a battle. It's a war. So defending the faith, defending the glorious gospel, defending sound doctrine of Jesus Christ is war. It's war. 1 Timothy 6.12, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. It will be a battle forever. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier for Jesus Christ. Reason why Paul uses those words. It is a battle. Hold faith. Let the word of God do the convicting and saying. That's what I'm saying. Hold it. Hold faith. Hold the doctrine. Hold the scripture. Let the word of God. Let people see. Let the word of God do the convicting and saving. We're just a vessel. Just hold it so others can read it. Having a good conscience, let our motivation be rooted in love, like it says in 1 Timothy 1. Preach the glorious gospel. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 and 3 says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared. And I can just see, a lot of times when I read searing, I see when you brand a calf, you can hear that searing of that brand branding that and I could just see people's minds being seared by an unsound doctrine having their conscience seared with a hot iron forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth let our minds not be seared with an unsound or unbiblical doctrine and then I say like Hymenus and Alexander let us not be a shipwreck to others' faith. If you're a leader, if you're one that's out there, don't swerve out on the path and go back to the law and tell people, you know, they got to follow the commandments because that's that will never save anybody. Let's not be a shipwreck to people's faith. Believers who decide to become apostates, they have departed from the glorious gospel. These individuals have been delivered unto Satan. And we'll look at 1 Corinthians 5, 5. And to me, we have apostolic discipline happening here in 1 Corinthians 5, 5. But I think there's also a message here for us. There's somebody within the body that's doing such a thing. You know what? We probably shouldn't associate with them. We probably need to pray for them. But ultimately, we have scripture to tell us you know what? Deliver their body. Deliver them unto us. Let Satan ultimately deal with them. And then God will take care of their soul. And we have that scripture here, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. To deliver such one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. The spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I shouldn't associate with people, those ones that are perverting the gospel. I shouldn't be associated with ones promoting an unsound doctrine. Just like the Bible says here, deliver them unto Satan that they may learn not to blossom. I'll pray for them. But ultimately, they will pass them on to the world here. That's too bad, though, that we see apostates happening within the church. The people actually that were sound on the gospel for many years, and they've departed from the way. Let this hand here represent you and I and this sin here, this wallet here represents our sin. 
God loves us, but he hates our sin. Our sin, Isaiah 59, 2 says, it keeps us separate from him. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. He's God from eternity past, the everlasting God. And he ultimately revealed himself in the flesh, and he went to the cross, and he shed his blood. And he died, and he resurrected the third day, showing his pain for sin is paid in full. And if you would believe that, your faith is counted as righteousness because you're seen as Christ, and Christ's death payment is put to your account, and you're seen as righteous as Christ. So hopefully right here, somebody would like to put their faith in Jesus Christ right now. Let's close. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we just want to thank you for Christ. So thankful that you love the sinners just the way we are. And that you sent your beloved Son to the cross of Calvary to die for our sins, be buried, resurrected for us. And Father, right now, maybe somebody here, hearing the wonderful words of life, hearing your words, the glorious gospel, a sound doctrine. Right now, they're like, you know what, that makes sense. I'm a sinner. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of my faith, so I'm going to put my faith trusting in Jesus Christ and Christ alone to save me. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins, buried, resurrection for me. Right now that person can be like, Father, thank you because they've just been born again. And Father, we want to pray for your children, the body of Christ that's here. Father, we just pray that we would continue to work with each other, hold each other accountable, that we would stay in the Word of God and let your Word ultimately, that we would read your Word, that we would grow in grace, and it's all about Jesus Christ, Lord, Savior. And Father, we just pray that nobody would depart from the way. Please, that would just, it's a tragedy when we see that happen. And we know that men will go back and preach the law, and ultimately the Bible says they know not what they preach. There's an emptiness to it. Because when you keep your mind on Christ and you grow in grace, we learn that everything speaks of Christ. Just like in Acts chapter 3, verse 13, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob glorified Jesus Christ. Truth never changes. We know that in Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same today as he was yesterday and he'll be tomorrow. It's always been about him, will always be about him. It's the everlasting gospel. What an awesome thing that we have the word of God, we can read it, study it, and we grow in it. So, Father, we pray for the body of Christ. We pray for protection here. We pray for, you know, uh, you know, a building as you continue to work in individuals and and uh, for property and things like that. We just, Father, we just pray that you continue to lead. And you know, it is our prayer that by next Easter, you know, we would have a our own little building where we could gather. We know that, uh, you know, the church, the family would grow. So, Father, we pray for that. We pray for, you know, so just our kids. A lot of people here have their own sons and daughters here, grandkids. So we pray for them, Father, that you keep hedge of protection around them. And we pray that, you know, we'd, we would raise them right, raise them on the foundation of the gospel. And we know that they shall not depart from that when we raise them on that foundation. So, Father, we just pray that you'd bless this body that's here today. We pray that you'd be with the people here at Majestic. We pray that you'd be with the people that work here to continue to give them patience and compassion. Is there an extension of you, Father? And we pray that you'd bring us all back next week where we continue to give glory to you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll sing our last song before we depart.